anchor, folks. The eternal God is thy refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. Amen, amen. If you have your Bibles tonight, I'd like for you to turn to the book of 1 Timothy, chapter number 2 and verse number 1. 1 Timothy, chapter 2 and verse number 1. First Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 2.1 The scripture says, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Father, bless this holy word, Lord. In thy holy name, Savior. Amen. You can be seated. If you'll notice, the apostle mentions supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Uh, regardless of whether, what you think personally about someone, in leadership, uh, whether he be your mayor, your governor, your president, or your king, or your uh, queen, or uh, prime minister, uh, you should be praying for him. And uh, because they certainly need divine help. There is no question about that. They need divine help. But I'm going to call your attention to what it says here in chapter number two, first, uh, first Timothy 2. Supplications, prayers, and then the third word, intercessions. Intercessions has to do with the interceding. What does it mean to intercede? It means to go into the place of another, to step in for that other. A classic example of intercession is when Abraham interceded outside of Sodom and Gomorrah he stood between God. The Bible said he stood before the Lord. In plain words, he stood between God and Sodom. God would have had to go through or over Abraham to get to Sodom. And Abraham stood before him. He interceded. He cried out on behalf of one who couldn't cry out for himself. It's obvious that Lot did very little praying while he was in Sodom and Gomorrah. Prayer is the heartbeat and breath of your life and your soul as it relates to the Lord. Once again tonight, I want to encourage you, if you're not going to have a prayer life, to start one. Start simply. Set aside a time during the day. It doesn't have to be long, but start. Once you get started, the prayer life can develop into something much, much different than what it was when it started. Prayer for each other, by each other, prayer to God. Let me say this tonight. You do not need to go through any woman or any man. There's one God and there's one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. There is no other mediator. You need to go through no one but Christ Jesus the Lord. That prayer will go directly to God the Father by based upon his office in the priesthood, high priesthood of Melchizedek because of who he is and what he accomplished at the cross. But I'm going to give you some points tonight about intercession. What is that, preacher? Intercession is prayer. Make no mistake about it. Intercession is prayer. It's prayer in one of its purest forms, but it is prayer in a unique form. It's prayer that is so necessary that it's overlooked today and folks don't pay much attention to intercession. But intercession will literally change your life if God lays his hand upon you to intercede. Now let me give you a few things tonight about intercession. First of all, intercession is to pray for one who cannot pray for themselves. When I get down and pray, I have it up my heart, I can see a face. That face used to be in this house. That face has stood in this pulpit and preach the Word of God. I get on my knees and I pray to God for that one that used to preach right here. I intercede. I do not believe that he does any praying. 
I do not believe that I have the right to criticize him or say anything about him if I don't have enough of the grace of God to put him on my heart and carry him to the Lord. Amen. 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 Because the spirit that gets associated with things like that can destroy you. You'd be amazed at the power that Satan has to weave treachery into your very life. What may start out as appearing to be good can wind up to be poison. And so therefore, I pray for him. I pray for others. If I were in the same situation as this man, I'd want somebody praying for me. If I had slipped and fallen and fallen back and fallen deep into sin, I'd want somebody that God could move up on their heart to begin to pray for me. So why is it so necessary to pray? Because it is the channel of grace. Prayer offered to God opens the door of grace. Grace brings all the blessings that God has for any of us. The grace of God. The great, remember this, God does everything that he does for you through grace. Grace, the unmerited favor of the Lord. It's the goodness of God from his good heart, from his gracious and merciful heart. God does these things for us. And so I pray for him. I pray for little babies like Jude that cannot pray for themselves. His mother and his father have a burden to carry, no question about that. Like our brother said a moment ago, they need somebody to lift them up. And it gets so great that they need somebody to intercede. So I pray for him. I pray for this little boy. Pray for people that are in the intensive care unit, sometimes on respirators, completely out of it, and completely in a, unable to pray for themselves. And intercessory prayer is when you project yourself in and say, Lord God, put it upon my heart, burden me so that I can pray with a heart of genuine sincerity for the individual and for their needs. And intercessory prayer is one of the greatest blessings in the world because it takes your mind off yourself. You're not praying about your needs, you're praying for someone else. But remember this great principle of God. Grace received is grace ministered. Grace ministered from God must be received by somebody. You can become a channel where that grace comes through you to them because you're on your face praying, you're receiving the blessing from God for that individual. He allows you a place of access to God. He gives you a place of privilege because he knows the motivation of your heart. And when you come before the Lord and cry out to God for a special need like that, he ministers grace through you to them. And my friend, you can't help but receive some of the grace that's coming through you to them. That's a blessing from God, amen. So one of the aspects of intercession is to pray for one who cannot pray for themselves. The second one is to take a burden on oneself. The Bible says in the book of Galatians chapter number 6, to bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. In Galatians chapter number 6, he has a, he has a, a way of saying this. It's, it's remarkable. Watch this. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual... Restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. If a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. This is all in context together. To bear someone's burden is to say to yourself, by the grace of God, I would be in that mess. I could fall so easily. Instead of rising up in this judgmental condemnation attitude, holier than thou, kick them while they're down. You get down on your knees and say, Lord God, they need help. But they don't, you don't say it as a self-righteous hypocrite where you've picked them apart and you know everything they need. You get on your face and cry out, God, help them and bear their burdens. In plainer words, you've got to take within your heart where they are and what they're doing in order to take their place before God. Imagine that you are in that situation. Imagine your family's coming apart. Imagine your children have run off and done something that would break your heart. Imagine that your life is coming to pieces. Then you get down on your face and cry, God, help me that I might help them and that I might bear that burden. To bear the burden becomes an intercessor. And by being an intercessor, God ministers grace through you. Because the spiritual ones are the ones who do the restoration. A ministry of restoration is a ministry of God, a gift from God. Everybody can't do that. Most Christians, it's been my experience, find that when a Christian falls, that they either try to hide behind them 
spend all their time criticizing them or use them as some kind of a whipping block as an example to beat somebody over the head with. But if you're a spiritual Christian, you won't hide behind them. What do you mean by hide? That means, in other words, give you a license to go out and do the same thing. Some Christians go to church and all they have on their mind is what somebody else is doing. They can't have their own personal relationship with the Lord. If some Christian falters and falls and gets weak, that's a license to them to do the same. Well, if that's all Christianity is and that's all it is, then I can do the same thing. You don't understand what it's about in here. It's about your relationship with the Lord. It's about your service to God. Whether your brother stands or falls should not affect whether you stand or fall. Because if you are spiritual, when your brother stands or your brother falls, you're going to pray for your brother. And if he goes under, you'll, you'll be there to pick him and pray for him and lift him up. George Mueller was a Prussian. That was a, that was a province of Germany before they were all came together and created into one unit, <laughs> one nation <clears throat> back in the uh, 19th century. George Mueller was a wicked man, but he got saved. He spent years in Great Britain building a orphanage in Bristol, England. And you've heard the story of Mueller. They sat down one time at the table, they had no food, and he all these had all these hungry orphans, and George Mueller said, Lord, we thank you. We know that you provide our needs and thanked God for the food. And the kids were sitting there looking at each other, said there's no food on the table. What do you mean thanking God for the food? And when he finished the prayer, the no, the, there was a knock on the door and a man had stopped with a wagon load of bread. And he stopped and gave that bread to those kids and they had something to eat. Well, let me read something that happened to Mueller after he left the orphanage. He traveled around the world for about 18 years before the Lord took him on home. In 1877, he was aboard the ship Sardinia bound for the United States. They ran into dense fog off the coast of Newfoundland, which severely slowed down their progress. George Mueller told the captain of his need to be in Quebec the following Saturday afternoon, to which the captain replied, that's impossible. The captain thought Mueller was mad when he suggested they should go to the chart room and pray. You see, he'd spent all of his life praying, and God had answered prayer time and time again. When the captain pointed out the density of the fog, George Mueller replied, My eye is not on the density of the fog, but on the living God who controls every circumstance of my life. Mueller restrained the captain from praying because he was not a believer, but after he himself had prayed, invited the captain to open the door, the fog had lifted. The story was subsequently told by the captain who himself became a Christian. He prayed the fog away. Does God do things like that, preacher? You better believe he does. He can pray it and take it away. Now, number three is to stand in for before God. Look at Ezekiel chapter number 22 and verse number 30. Ezekiel 22 verse 30. The Lord said, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Do you see this? God said, I was looking for someone who would stand there. I wanted one who would stand and represent the people. He's looking for a church. He's looking for a pastor. He's looking for a Christian. That'll stand true to the faith, the word of God, to what was handed to us so graciously by those who've gone on before us. They didn't hand us an ecumenical mess. Your grandfathers and grandmothers and your fathers and your mothers, they didn't hand to you this contemporary, uh, feel-good, uh, rock rap church. They handed you a church of God that was blessed and that had been revived and had the power of God moving in it where souls were saved. That's the heritage that was handed to us. Now, what will we hand to these young people if the Lord doesn't come back soon? What will we leave for them? Who will stand in the gap? Who will stand up and say, not so, enough is enough? Who will do that? That's an intercessor. That's one who takes himself and puts himself between the enemy and the people. 
God said, I'm looking for somebody that'll do that. I'm looking for that. Now, why does he look for that? God Almighty can do anything he pleases, but he limits himself to work in a certain way so that when God does something, he justified and he can justify the ungodly. He does it because of his graciousness and to satisfy his holiness. He does it a certain way. He limits himself. And this is the reason today, thanks be unto God, that we're able to do these things. Abraham stood in the gap. So did David. Number four, look at Isaiah chapter number 62 and verse 6. Isaiah 62 and verse number 6. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. They lived to declare the ministry of God, the truth of God. The watchman on the wall was to be continually diligent. He was to be watching out for the destruction, for the lies, for the deceit. These are people gifted of God that see the danger before most of the Christians don't see the danger. When danger begins to come into a church, it comes in a very small way. When I preached to you this morning about repentance, how it had been taken out of the gospel of Christ, we have thousands and thousands in this country that have gone down the easy believism road. They've been led to the Lord, quote unquote, with a sinner's prayer, prayed a few words, everything is just fine. So and so led me to the Lord, but they don't know the Lord. One of the pastors of the biggest churches in this country sitting in prison right now, sitting in prison because he molested a girl under 17, took her across the state line. Yet he was in demand all over the country to be preached here, preached there, and the a big name, big church and all of that. And I have serious doubts that he ever knew the Lord. But let me say something. I have prayed for that man daily. I've called his name out to God daily. I've cried out to God daily to touch his heart and touch his soul. And if he's truly not born again, to turn the lights on for him and show him what true salvation is about. Don't come to me, first of all, with this backslid stuff. Let's find out if you really know the Lord. Let's find out if you really had a conversion experience with the Lord. Find out if you really have the Holy Spirit. Find out if you really know what this is about. And if you really do, then the backslidden part will take care of itself because God chastens those that he loves. He'll chasten you. In Hebrews chapter 12, he makes it perfectly clear. A watchman is one who sees the danger well, as, as, it as, it, as it first comes and begins to develop itself inside the church, he sees it coming. He identifies it. He has spiritual discernment, he or she. They understand these things. And when I read to you from the amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, and they've changed the wretch now to, to accommodate this self, self, uh, hedonistic, uh, narcissistic, this self-love, this self, 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 that's what it's all about today. And so the message is tailored today to make self feel good. So we don't want to make you feel like a wretch. We want to take the wretch out of amazing grace. But the problem is that if the wretch is not in amazing grace, where's the amazing grace? When you take the wretch out, what's the amazing grace? Amazing grace is for wretches. Amen. Amen. It saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we'll have no less days to sing God's praise than when it all begun. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. The man that wrote that song, folks, you, most of you know it, Newton, but the, most of you don't. Most of you know. You know also that he was a slave trader. He, he he profited in trafficking human flesh, no doubt being a slave trader. One of the one of the one of the uh, 
I don't know what you call it. One of the parts of being a slave trader was watching the death on board the ship. They would leave Africa with 1,500, 2,000 packed like cordwood. They'd get to the States with 700, 800. Half of them would be dead. Dead bodies being tossed off the ship all along the way. Die from disease, die from malnutrition, die from all kinds of problems. And so therefore they, they, they packed it as full as they could to be sure that when they got to their destination, they would have as many as they possibly could to make, make the trip profitable. There he dealt in death. He dealt in suffering. And he felt the full weight of the wrath of God come down on his soul. He realized what a dirty dog he was. And real, that realization brought him to the point of repentance. And it brought him to the place of salvation. And he asked God to be merciful to him, a sinner. And by the grace of God, God was gracious and merciful. And he forgave him of all of his sin, including the slave trade and the murder of all of those blacks, the black folk that he carried out of Africa. God saved him and wrote his name in heaven. And now a former slave trader is singing in glory. That's what the gospel's about. He's no respecter of persons. Red, yellow, black, and white, they're all precious in his sight. Christ tasted death for every man. Amen. And so his slave trading business ceased. And he began to preach the gospel of Christ. God's looking for a watchman. In Isaiah chapter number 55, 59, and verse number 16, he says this. He said, and he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness had sustained him. In plain words, he couldn't reach out. He couldn't receive it from someone else. Is there an intercessor at Temple Baptist Church? Yes. Is there someone at Temple Baptist Church that sees the problem before it ever develops and begins to carry it into the throne room of God? Is there someone at Temple Baptist Church that sees a brother or sister going through a hard time and instead of mocking it and making fun of it and, and broadcasting it and, and, and talking about it, they get on their face and they begin to cry out to God and intercede on their behalf. He's looking for that. If the Lord comes to a church and that church has beautiful stained glass windows, pipe organs, it has the most plush carpet, it's got the greatest that money can buy, huge building, huge crowd, but there's not one single soul in that whole congregation on their face crying out to God. What do you think he thinks that is? Think about it. He doesn't see as we see. He doesn't see as we see. The life of the church is not in some outward thing. The life of the church is on its knees. That's where the power comes from. And then the power is manifested when you come together as a congregation. The Apostle Paul said, I didn't come to you with excellency of speech after man's wisdom. But he said, I came to you in the spirit and the power, the demonstration of the spirit and the power. The Lord Jesus Christ did not speak as the scribes and Pharisees. They said, never man spake like this man. He spoke with power. Everything Christ did, he did it in power. The reason he did it in power because he was anointed of God. Where do you get the anointing, preacher? You get it on your knees. You get it in your closet. You get it crying out to God. You get it when you become less selfish and more of someone else's burdens and heart and soul. To reach out and cry out to God for someone who's in dire need. Lord knows, man, we have much need. Do you realize the church of God has let for the last 40, 50 years, let this country slip right through its hands? It's done a lot of talking, but that's all it's done. It's let this whole nation, this is my country, it's let this country slip right through its hands. The average American today is as ignorant of the Bible as he can be and dead in trespasses and sins. Look at the corruption of the government. Look at what's happening in this nation. What's, why? Judgment starts first at the house of God. This is the pillar and ground of the truth. This is the source of light. Amen, folks. This is, if this light is turned out, there is no light. The Bible said you're the salt of the earth. If you have lost that saltiness, then you've lost your savor. The Bible said then you're good for nothing. And it's up to the church of God. That's who we are. It's the pillar and ground of the truth. We should see the enemy long before the world sees the enemy. We should know the nature of the battle long before they understand the nature of the battle. And we ought to know what the weapons of our warfare are all about, shouldn't we? So in Isaiah, he said that. Now here's a good one right here in the book of Daniel. Look over here in Daniel chapter number 10, verse 12. Daniel was an intercessor. Daniel chapter number 10 and verse 12. 
Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God. Thy words were heard. And some of you in here tonight, your words have already been heard. They've been heard. You just haven't seen the answer yet. Notice why I hear. And I come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, Michael is an archangel. Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. The messenger is an angel. And Daniel prayed. God sent the answer to his prayer through the messenger, through the angel. But as the angel was coming with the answer to Daniel's prayer, a, one of the principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places, that spiritual order that you cannot see with your eyes but nonetheless exists, that spiritual order that governs over this earth because Satan is the god of this world, they have boundaries, they have principalities, and they have powers. One of these creatures had hindered that angel from coming to Daniel and answering his prayer. So this angel cried out, and when he did Michael, an archangel, an archangel means that he's in a higher order than an angel. An archangel, the only one so mentioned in scripture is Michael. Most think Gabriel is too and probably is. But Michael came and Michael answered this and it was 21 days later, three times seven, that he finally arrived with the answer to prayer. Now when you're praying, your prayer may have already gone to the ear of God. God might have heard your prayer on the first prayer, but it might have been the second, it might have been the third. It might have been the second day, it might have been the third week, it might have been the second year. In plainer words, it was when your prayer didn't fall to the ground, but it rose up in the ear of God, and God heard you. In the Bible, when God hears you, that means the answer's on the way. That's what that means, and God heard him. Time and again, the Bible says, and the Lord heard him. The Lord heard him. That's what it means. When he heard you, then the answer's going to come. And so God heard the prayer of Daniel. He'll hear your prayer. Once your prayer is offered from a spirit and from a heart that cries out to God in dependence and faith, that comes to him, that sincerely and genuinely desires to know the will of God, to yield yourself to the hand of God and give your life into his hand, you'll find him receptive. You'll be amazed at how that spiritual world begins to open up for you if you'll come to the Lord and just be honest about it. Be honest. God's not interested in a bunch of high-sounding theological cliches. All he wants is simplicity out of us, a heart that's simple and a heart that's truthful, and start talking to him. God will hear you, and he'll send the answer. Now, the answer can be hindered. Sometimes the answer can be hindered because of a spiritual force that intercedes, that, that steps in to stop that answer to prayer. So how, what do you do, preacher? You just keep praying. Because your prayers will be answered if God's got to muster up more power, another angel like he did here, to get it through. And that's exactly what he did. He got the answer through. Don't stop praying. Persevere. Pray through. That's the point here. Back in Daniel chapter number 6, the Bible said three times a day, Daniel would turn his face toward Jerusalem and he would pray. He did this the last time he did it, knowing full well that a sentence of condemnation had been passed against him if he did that very thing, and yet he did it anyway, as he had always done. Nothing presumptuous about it. It was the way he lived. No hypocrisy involved. And when he cried out to God, God heard him. God heard him. What did they do to Daniel, by the way? They put him in a den of lions, didn't they? They put him in a den of lions. He certainly did. And they would have eaten him, and that would have been the end of Daniel. But they didn't touch him. They couldn't touch him because he shut the lion's mouth. The lion, of course, is a type of the devil because the devil is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. But the ones who accused him, what happened to them? They got thrown into the very den and the scripture says the lions had the mastery over them, break their bones, and had supper. 
and they were finished off because they accused Daniel. They, what they did, here's where they made their mistake. They got a hold of the wrong man. Here's the guile of the world. Here's the guile of the world. That is, they create a stereotype of Christians from their personal experience with Christians. They create a stereotype in their mind. What does that mean? That means that they think all Christians are like the ones they know. See? Let's say the Christian they know is a vacillating, weak, need, uh, you know, uh, wishy-washy, uh, in and out, uh, you know, the pilgrims. We've got a few pilgrims like that. They show up once or twice a year. Everybody's got them. They make a pilgrimage to church and, you know, like that. They think all Christians are like that, okay? And so that's what these people thought they had that idea. But what they don't realize is that all Christians aren't like that. But sometimes they pick on the wrong Christian. They pick on one to get a hold of God. One that can get a hold of God. One that's humble. One who knows, as the Apostle Paul said, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. You, you know that when they locked Paul up in his own hired house, uh, how many of you heard that he died at the Mamertine prison when they cut his head off? Okay, you've heard that. I've heard it preached. Might have preached it myself years ago. The truth of the matter is, we have no authority for that whatsoever. There's no biblical authority for that. None. The Apostle Paul wasn't even locked up in prison. According to the scripture, he was a house. He was confined to his house. And he could receive visitors. And he did over the space of I forget how many years. We don't know what happened to Paul, to be honest with you. According to, the, according to the scripture, it doesn't say what happened to him. But I know what he said. He said, I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished my course. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Yes. Son Timothy, he said, Preach the word. So how did Paul leave here? He left here in faith. That's how he left. He was ready to go. And then finally, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10 and verse number 4. You'll find the intercessor doing this. 2 Corinthians 10, 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And what follows is the casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. The battle for the mind. But the Apostle Paul says that we wage a warfare. Most Christians don't want the warfare. And they, they shrink from the warfare. But you have to be constantly diligent in warfare. You never let your guard down. You've always got a guard. There is no such thing as camping. If you're in war, especially if you're in the enemy territory, you don't hit the rack and turn the lights out and wake up the next morning. You post guards. You're prepared. You're ready. You're ready for anything. Be prepared. Be ready. That's what a Christian should do because this warfare never ceases. It's constant. It's day in and day out unrelenting. It's a war of attrition. It's not a war of army against army. It's a war of attrition. It's like the Amalekites when they smite you from the rear and they get the weakest of your people. They come up from the rear and they block your entrance. They won't let you go by. That's what the Amalekite did. Amalek did. That's how that, this war is fought. They go after the weak ones and they smite them down. It's a war of attrition. It's where they fire rockets into Israel from the Sinai. From the Gaza Strip, they fire rockets in. Sidorot, Sidor I think is the name of the city. It's the southernmost city of Israel. They have constant barrage. You hear very little about it, but constantly they're being rocketed, rocketed, fire rockets in, and killing their people, killing their women, killing their children. It's constant. It's a war of attrition. The terrorist sneaks in, and he blows himself up, and he goes off to his 70 virgins, he thinks, and he murders so many people right before he leaves this earth. That's a war of attrition. 
America is beginning to experience a war of attrition. The Boston killers up there in Boston Marathon, that's attrition. It's not an army against an army. It's just an, in, it's, it's an infiltration. It's, it's coming in, and, they're, and they fight you. They hit you here. They hit you there. They hit you here. They hit you there. That's the way Satan fights you. That's the way he deals with you. He'll hit you here. He'll hit you there. Withdraw a while. Hit you again over here. He'll raise some up against you. He'll put some obstacle in front of you. He'll raise up some devil inside your own soul. That's the attrition that we're fighting. It's a war. You can never let your guard down. You may feel like, well, finally I've won the battle and I can be at peace. No, sirree. There is no such thing. Not until we leave this world. You've got to be constantly on guard. This means that when you get in the closet and you pray, you should ask God to give you spiritual discernment to identify the weapon, to identify the fight, to identify the enemy. What is it bothering you? What's coming against you? What's eating you up? What's eating at your soul? What kind of a battle are you in right now? We're in something. Your mind, the battle for the mind, the battle for the soul, the battle for your family, the battle for your children, the battle for your wife and your husband. The battle rages. It rages against churches. Satan plants somebody in a church, and when he plants them in that church, he'll let them like a sleeper cell. They'll stay there for a while. Then through that individual, he'll raise up Satan right inside the congregation. And the natural tendency of sheep, it's their natural tendency. When a Satan is raised up, scatters the sheep. And Satan knows that. He knows that. So therefore, that's the way he operates. And when he scatters the sheep, of course, he creates confusion. And when confusion comes in, strife comes in. And where strife enters in, every evil work. That's what happens. So you've got to be on your guard. Don't turn against each other so quickly. Don't listen to false uh, attacks and rumors against each other. Don't take every little look from somebody as something bad. Don't, don't think just because somebody at the other end of the building is talking, they're talking about you. Don't get the idea that when you walk through the back door that everybody in the church drops what they're doing and they turn around and look at you and that's all they're thinking about. They got their own lives to live. Everybody in here's got problems. <laughs> I've had people say to me, I can't go to that church anymore down there. That's all they talk. They talk about me like a dog. Like Richard Nixon said, well, you won't have me to kick around anymore when he resigned as president. <laughs> he, got on that, he got on that airplane wherever he flew to. I'll never forget Nixon. So he won't have me to kick around anymore. Who's kicking you around? Do you get this complex? The idea? Has Satan got you brow beat? Has he got you beaten into the, into the point to where you think that you are? Really be it that everybody thinking about you, talking about you? Believe me, they're not. People have their own lives to live. And they've got a, a the truth of the matter is you must think awful highly of yourself if you think that they're thinking about you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. No, Satan uses our fears, he uses our doubts, he uses all these things against us. And we war a war. I encourage you tonight to get back in the battle. Get back in the battle. I heard a preacher say years ago, he said, it's time to pick up the jawbone again. You know who he's talking about. Pick up the jawbone again. Maybe that's what somebody, some of you need to do tonight. Reach down there and pick that jawbone back up. And that jawbone, of course, you know what that represented and who used it in the Old Testament. That's what we need to do. Forget, uh, don't be thinking about yourself so much. Get your mind on somebody and others, somebody else's needs. You'd be amazed that once you begin to intercede for somebody else's need, God will raise up somebody to intercede for your need. And when you intercede unselfishly for someone, and that's when you're praying for someone else, they're doing the same thing for you. And that's a channel of grace where God can bless you, heal you, and help you. Father, in thy name we pray. For Jesus' sake we ask it. You've been good to me, Lord. You've been good to me. You've been good to me in spite of me. You've helped me even though I've resisted you. You've touched me even though I've run from you. You've been good to me. God, tonight, however I need to say it, however I need to do it, I want you to get all praise and glory and honor, not some false, made-up, humble thing from me, but the truth. I am what I am, Lord, by your grace. I am what I am by the grace of God. And I want you to get glory for everything in this house. Help somebody tonight. 
Maybe somebody heard what I said. Heard it, Lord. They didn't hear it with their ear. They heard it in their heart. Maybe somebody heard it and they can get help. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand up and sing, brother. What have we got? Page 17 in your All-American. <laughs> A few weeks ago, how many of you know where Mount Everest, you know what I'm talking about? 29,000 plus feet, highest mountain in the world. And uh, they hire these Sherpa guides to, uh, to, to lead them up that mountain, which is wise. <laughs> and once they hire the Sherpa guide, of course the guide knows which crevice to take them through, which ridge to go over in this way to find their way to the top of that thing. Mount Everest is a huge mountain. Well, something happened the other day that I never heard in my life, and I thought, this is something beats all I've ever seen. They had a fight. Did any of you read about it? There was a fight broke out. These, these, they had people from different nations that make up parties and plunder where, you know, have some from the, from the Netherlands and some Germans and some Frenchmen and all that get together, and they take a group up to climb to the top of that thing. Well, they started fighting among themselves, and the, and the Sherpa guide got in the middle of the fight. They had one knock-down, drag-out dog fight on, the, on, the, on the, uh, the slopes of Mount Everest. And uh, I thought to myself, you know, here these people are in a treacherous situation to start with. Take one wrong step. Folks, do you know how many dead bodies are on the side of Mount Everest? Been there for decades? Dead bodies? Mount Everest is strewn with dead bodies everywhere in places that you can't get to. And I thought, take one step and you'll be the next victim. You'll be down in a crevice down here, two or three miles deep or something like that. And, uh, you know, there you are. And here they are in a dog fight going up the side of that. And I thought to myself, that's the way Christians are. That's truth. <laughs> Christians are like that. Instead of helping each other and bearing one another's burdens and overlooking a lot of stuff and not carrying your feelings on your shoulder and have some graciousness about you. And, uh, you know, you'd be amazed at how that camaraderie, how that fellowship, how that koinonia that pulls you together, how much grace comes out of that and power comes from that. You'd be surprised and how God can work in that and how he starts saving souls through that. But my experience has been that, that uh, they're like that bunch on the side of Everest. They get in a knockdown, drag out fight. And I'll guarantee you one thing, when you start fighting at Everest, there's going to be some casualties. That's no play place. You don't go to Mount Everest to play. <laughs> no, sir. You don't go there to play. They say that when they climb to the top of that mountain, there's a window. There's a window. Once they reach the highest point, 29,000, whatever it is, feet, they can only be there so long. There's a window. So the guide has to time it to get them to the top of that, to reach that at a certain time. Then they have to get down from there. You see, above 10,000 feet, you have to have oxygen and your body if you don't get oxygen your blood will start will start uh, you, you'll, you'll go into what's called spatial disorientation uh, what's the word for it uh, 
uh, vertigo. You'll go into vertigo. You, 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 drunk. You'll get drunk. And at 29,000 feet, folks, they've all got masks on. Got masks. That means they can only stay up there so long. They can only carry so much oxygen. They've got to get up there and they've got to get back down. So they are, their life is literally in the hands of that guide. And so the last thing you want to do is get in a dog fight with your guide. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> People can do some stupid things, I'm telling you. That's the last man. You want to be friends with your guide. <laughs> Wouldn't it be something if he got you to the top of Everest up there and said, see ya. <laughs> Find your way down. <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, Use some wisdom. There's really, most of the time, the stuff that comes up in the church is Mickey Mouse nothing. Yeah. Nothing. And I know time and time again, people have been mad at each other, and after a few years, they plumb forgot what they were mad about. <laughs> because it didn't mean anything. Amen. Well, I have a word of prayer, and we'll let you go. God bless you. Don't forget now, put the tent up out here.